Hello and good morning, and you're very welcome to today's virtual conference. My name is Mark Gibson, and uh, you're very welcome to today's uh, conference, which is a lasting collaboration between Chagask, which is the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority, and Scotland's Rural College. Today's conference will be examining the potential of digitalization to achieve a sustainable natural economy. So you're very, very welcome. Uh, so today, uh, just to make you aware, most of you are aware at this stage of how to use Zoom, but if you have a question that you'd like to pose to our panel, uh, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we welcome uh, all of your questions and comments throughout today's uh, uh, virtual conference. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Jerry Boyle, who is Director of Chagask, who is going to open uh, the, today's virtual conference. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special event. This is our third annual joint Chagas SRUC conference, as Mark said, on the theme of digitalization and the natural economy. My name is Jerry Boyle, I'm director of Chagas, and for our Scottish viewers, Chagas is, of course, a Gaelic word. It means instruction. And uh, we're absolutely delighted uh, to be able to join forces with our partner organization, SRUC. And we've enjoyed a long standing relationship with SRUC, and that's not surprising for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, Chagas and SRUC share a unique structure. Um, certainly in European, if not in global, in global terms, in that within the one organization, we have a research function embracing both agriculture and food. Uh, we've also got a, an education function. And thirdly, we have an advisory extension consulting function. And um, as I say, that is, is a unique structure. We have been collaborating particularly at research level for several years, and um, our research colleagues um, uh, work very closely together on several different projects. And of course, um, Ireland shares many similarities with Scotland in terms of the nature of our agricultural systems, particularly our livestock sectors, and of course, as today's event uh, focuses on, uh, we also share similar challenges, particularly in terms of um, sustaining our natural economy and um, climate change. And um, I would also have to say, of course, we share a proud Celtic heritage. So I'm looking forward to a really interesting session this morning. We have an excellent lineup of speakers from, from both of our organizations. And it's my great pleasure now to hand you over to um, Wayne Powell to chair the first session. Wayne. Good morning, everyone. And thanks very much, Jerry. And uh, certainly I'm um, very keen um, to uh, celebrate our Celtic heritage. And uh, of course, um, my condolences on the rugby at the weekend, but um, that's the last I'll mention about, um, about rugby, I promise. Um, so looking forward to the session as well. And I think this is a really important time for us to be looking at data and particularly in relation to the natural economy, because in some ways the natural economy provides the platform for, uh, for a green recovery, particularly when we think of nature-based solutions. The other thing I think that uh, our both uh, our institutions share is that we have two things. Um, one is we data rich and data intensive institutions. But secondly, we have considerable domain expertise. And the question I suppose for us, when we look at the, the opportunities we face is how can we really start um, thinking creatively about the way in which we can utilize data and the fundamental ch changes that are taking place in society including the way in which um, data can be collected, the way in which data can be used, and the way in which this is almost uh, transforming the research process 
as well. So very, very excited about um, today's session. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to our first uh, speaker, Professor Donach Berry, and look forward to, um, to the presentations. Please do ensure that you turn your cameras off and mute, um, as Mark said at the outset, and we'll allow each speaker um, probably about um, 12 minutes, and we'll have a couple of questions at the end of, of each, present, uh, each presentation. So look forward to listening to you, Donach, and over to you. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Um, and just as, as you finished off, um, I'd like to congratulate you guys over there on your superb win over the weekend. So um, just so we're all on a level playing field on what is a decision support tool, this is just simply what, what I got off of, off of Wikipedia. Um, but you can define a decision support system as a computerized program, which helps support, hence the name, the determinations, judgment, judgments, and the course of action. Now, how I would really define it is it just really helps you make more informed decisions faster. If we look at some UK data uh, where a survey was undertaken on 244 farmers, almost half of those said that they use decision support tools. Around a quarter of them are software-based, a further quarter of them are paper-based, around 10% of those are apps. So it's really no different to what we would see in our own iPhones or our own Android, for example. It's full of different apps and, and therein, in a large extent, lies some of the problem. So what I'm going to talk about is, is these decision support tools as a vehicle for the deployment of innovation. And Richard's going to come on after me. He's going to talk about all about all these fancy sensors and stuff. But I really want to look at, well, how do we actually get this penetrated into the, the industry and being used by, by farmers, whatever species that they're operating on. Now, I'm a geneticist, and in case you don't, or you've never met a geneticist before, and you don't know, as well as being arrogant, we also like really talking about ourselves and talking about what we're doing. So although decision support tools in themselves, they're, they're, they're vast, they can be animal-based, soil-based, plant-based, food-based, I'm really just gonna take the case study of a breeding perspective. And here's just some of the examples of what we can achieve through animal breeding. Here's just a quick example of, of some of the processes or the decisions that farmers have to make. Now, this is on purpose, this is uh, very complex because the whole decision process itself is very complex. Also, I'm not gonna leave it up there for long because I know that many of you would actually have other things that you could bring in to this decision um, process. The, the graph itself and a lot of what we would work on is kind of agnostic to the species. So where I say animals up on top, you could put cow, you could put yo, you could put sow. Um, a lot of these different decisions are, are exactly the same. And there's three main areas. And we go through, we won't go through all of them, obviously. We'll go through a few of those pre-breeding, during the breeding season, and also then how you rear those, those, those animals that are produced from after that breeding. So if we just take the, the top part of it, and if we just focus on the breeding component. So how do farmers identify what is a good animal for breeding versus a bad animal for breeding to, to generate the next generation of animals? So what we use in animal breeding is a very, very simple decision support tool. It's called a breeding objective or a breeding goal. And here on, the, on this graph, this is just a representation um, of many different types of breeding goals that exist for, just for dairy cattle across the world. There are similarities, but there also are differences. So the three thing or criteria that a trait must fulfill in order to be considered in a breeding goal is A, it must be important. And heretofore, we've talked a lot about economic importance, but I believe in the future, we're gonna actually have to open up our mind to potentially talk about social importance. When we start talking about animal welfare, environmental cost, et cetera. Secondly, the trait must exhibit genetic variability. Now I've been doing this a long time. And I've yet, where somebody has to come up to me and show me a trait that has not, does not exhibit genetic variability. Hence, I think you can kind of remove number two because everything is some degree under genetic control. And thirdly, is the trait must be measurable or it must be associated or correlated with a measurable trait. And we're not talking about measuring things here on 10 animals or 100 animals or even 1,000 animals. We're talking of tens or hundreds or thousands of thousands of, of animals. Richard's gonna talk a little bit about all these, these different data streams that we, we have. So this is how this data 
can be integrated within what we call a breeding goal so that the farmer, rather than sifting through all these different data sources, has one figure at the end which she or he can use to rank their animals. And although it's only one figure, there's a huge complexity underpinning that. And that, this would be the work of most geneticists. So what are the, the traits, the phenotypes, for example? What are the edits? A lot of people, when they think about machine learning or artificial intelligence, they talk about data analytics. But there's actually a huge role in those two disciplines in actually the editing of data, the statistical model. Again, we have these advancements in, in data sciences that enable us to develop better statistical models and to do more sophisticated genetic or genomic evaluations. And then what weight do you put on these particular traits within the breeding goal? So this is one of the most contentious issues of, of uh, breeding objectives. But what I really like about breeding objectives as a decision support tool is that they can be made bespoke. So farmers can actually alter the weights within those, on those traits in the breeding goal, or they can alter the traits. But more importantly, as a decision support tool, breeding has been proven to deliver. Now it could deliver for a bad, or it can deliver for good, but it delivers on what you ask it to do. Also, it's permanent and it's cumulative. And I would also strongly argue it's sustainable. When we talk about breeding or, or shifting a population, we, we tend to talk a lot about breeding. And what we, I think, sometimes ignore is the culling and the decisions that exist for which animals do you cull from your system. So most traits would follow what we call a normal distribution is what I'm, what I'm showing you here. There's animals lie to one side of it, so to the positive side, you would potentially you would breed from these animals to produce the next generation. And that would shift your distribution to the right or improve the mean of your population. But you can also shift that distribution by culling the inferior animals. And of course, you can go a lot faster if you do both in tandem. Yes, we tend to ignore the decision support tools for culling, or at least for those that do exist, they are overly complex for farmers to use. We have developed two such culling indexes, one for dairy, one for, for beef. We're also looking at developing one for sheep. Not going to go into it in any great detail, but what I want to emphasize is, is this is a vehicle for which we can uh, take the information that the likes of Richard is going to talk about later on, package it into a usable format, which is in real time, which farmers can use to then make real time decisions. Like these indexes, I can say it because I, because I, was, uh, I, involved, I, I developed them, but they are really kind of uh, blunt instruments as it stands at the moment. And there's huge things that we can improve within these indexes for decision support tools. Moving quickly on, if we move on to the, the right-hand side, so we've identified animals that are genetically poor. So they're, they're still good, we don't want to cull them, we want to breed from them, but we don't want to breed replacements. So we will use what we call a terminal bull, which, or a terminal ram or a terminal male, which will generate progeny for slaughter. And again, we're back to this single value breeding goal decision support tools. This is just, I'm not gonna go through the detail, but this is just showing you the indexes, the breeding goals that exist for identifying beef bulls for use in dairy cows, for identifying beef bulls for use in beef cows, for identifying rams for use in sheep to generate these animals, which will be more profitable in the future. Again, the vehicle is there, the logistics, the pipeline, the framework is there, which enables us to add new modules as new data streams become available, develop new algorithms underneath this as developments in data science occur, but importantly to packages in the format that farmers are well acquainted to with for the last few decades. Moving on then to you have identified your genetically elite animals, so what do you do? Do you What's the likelihood of pregnancy? If there's a high likelihood, then maybe you should use more expensive or sex semen versus a low likelihood. This is just showing you some data is can we predict pregnancy? And this is some work we did a few years ago. In retrospect, when I think about it, it's, it was stupid trying to predict pregnancy because there's so much unknowns that are going to happen. So this is the likelihood of pregnancy. So much unknowns uh, that it's going to be really, really difficult to predict that. And those of you that would be Familiar, this is called a receiver operation characteristic curve, where if you're above that blue 45 degree line, it's, it's slightly better than just flipping a coin. Where we'd like to be is on this red line. But the reason why I put this up is, I believe when we're developing a lot of our decision support tools, what we always like to do is we like to put a prediction on everything. 
And maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should stand back from that. And maybe the, the, the speakers in the next session will talk a little bit about this, this social science com component to it. But if we were to just focus on the animals that we were really confident about, that they would become pregnant, then our accuracy of predicting those is considerably more. The other point about this, and I want to go back to the machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, again, when we talk about it, we talk a lot about from a prediction perspective, but they have huge roles in actually explaining a lot of these things. So expl explainable AI. So yes, we're going to give you a prediction, but how do we come about that prediction? And that's what, in, in the initial years at least, farmers really want to get a, a grasp a handle of. Other options, of course, are, are, are counterfactuals, as, as explaining, well, if you were to do X, Y, and Z, then you can alter the predicted outcome. The final thing that I want to talk about is, is risk management. And I'm just going to give you a case study of SIRE advice. So this is where we would have a decision support to where we advise farmers which male animal to mate to which particular female. And heretofore, many of us would talk about means. Oh, if we mate this bull with this cow, we expect on average the progeny will be X, Y, and Z. But I'm a farmer myself. And really, a lot of the time, yes, I'm interested in the mean, but I'm also interested in risk. I'm just showing you here, for example, two bulls for calving difficulty, where the blue bull, you expect it to generate progeny that are slightly more difficult calving, but you're more confident about it. While the red bull is lower reliability, so it has a wider potential distribution or a wider risk. So on average, you expect it to be easier calving, but what happened if it was actually in that green area? So as well as what we're looking at here is, is as well as creating or improving the mean, we also want to actually tighten up that, that variance or the variability so that we, we're managing the risk associated with, with these particular traits. So I think we need to, to alter our psyche about looking at means as opposed to, to variability and, and risk management into the future. So then finally, just, just finishing up, when you have the, the surplus animals, um, and I'm just gonna take the example of, of a beef cow. So you have a beef calf born, a beef female, either from a suckler cow or a, a beef from a, from a dairy herd. Farmers wanna weigh up the options. What am I gonna do with this female calf? Am I gonna slaughter it? Or am I actually going to use this animal, rear it and sell it to a beef farmer who will then uh, graduate that animal to the mature herd? So we have decision support tools for that. We have the beef own worth on the left hand side, which puts a value on this particular animal as if you were to slaughter it. And running in tandem with it, which we already discussed, is the beef female profit potential. Now, the beauty of these two decision support tools is they, they get their data from exactly the same repository and economically they're on the same terms. So you actually can weigh up well, will I make more money if I was to slaughter this animal versus sell it to a beef farmer? Um, and, and, and make money that way. So just to, to finish up my final two slides, um, again, by a lot of these decision support tools that, that are out there, they're kind of, they stand on their own. Um, while if you can collate all of these decision support tools together with the underlying data, for example, you could know the calving dates or the lambing dates into the future, the pregnancy rates, the expected pregnancy rates, which gives you an, a feel about, well, how many nully paris animals do I want? How many lambs or how many calves do I want? What's their growth rate? So what's their likely intake? About the young progeny, when are they going to be born and when am I going to sell them? So again, what is, what is the growth rates or, or intake or infrastructural needs of these animals? So this is hugely important from a resource allocation budgeting perspective, both for labor requirements, feed requirements, and also from a, an infrastructural requirements. And of course, then running in tandem with this or parallel with this, you have a completely other set of decision support tools, which is based on the feed availability. In Ireland, we would have pasture-based Ireland. So on one side, we have the feed requirements predicted per day for all of next year. And on the other side, we have the feed availability. So marrying the two together then will enable farmers to make more informed decisions. So if I was to summarize what I think or what I would like in decision support tools is they must easy, obviously be easy to use and understand. They should really be real time. And I say accurate and I put it accurate in inverted commas because they're support tools. So they don't have to be 100% accurate. They support the decision. It's up to the farmer to make the eventual decision. They need to be joined up both vertically and horizontally. I would like them to be modular in that you can plug in new modules as new data becomes available or new information becomes available. 
They should ideally be multifunctional. Um, I would like always like them to be agnostic to the species. So a lot of what I described, as I said, it can be applicable to lots of different species. Should I ideally exploit currently available data sources? We call these phenotypes because they're phenotypes that are for free, but it can be augmented with additional data, which I do believe also is one of the factors that are missing from most decision support tools that are available. And then finally, and really importantly, is a single point of truth. So if we look at this from a SRUC or eGenes perspective, or a Chagas and an Irish Cattle Breeding Federation perspective, this is where we would have some of our greatest strengths. So that's all. I'll take any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Donach. And uh, we've got a, um, over 190 participants uh, online, so I think we've got time to take a couple of questions. Uh, maybe I'll open up as, as, as some of the questions come in, uh, Donach. And I suppose one of the questions I have um, would be on how you see decisions, decision support tools supporting some of the more traits around sustainability and potentially traits around animal welfare. Um, how do you see the evolution of decision support tools supporting a new generation of traits for sustainability and animal welfare, more perhaps uh, consumer oriented traits? So uh, I, I, a lot of people talk about these new things and these new technologies, Wayne. I like to actually go back to the simplistic view of things. Maybe it's, a, it's the way that my simple brain is, is lined up. But if we talk about sustainability, the easiest one for me is age at slaughter. Because in the EU and UK, we we're legally obliged to record the date of birth and the date of slaughter. So we know how long that animal has actually lived for. And we know that animals that um, grow for longer as a growing animal will have a higher footprint. Right. So rather than actually going into the detail of measuring carbon output per day or feed intake per day, there are low hanging fruits there which have a massive potential. And you could do back of the envelope calculations to realize the costs, the economic costs, because when you talk about sustainability, people talk about environmental. But we have to think about it from an economic sustainability as well for the farmers. There is an economic benefit and there's an environmental benefit of harvesting these animals months before when they're actually due. So to me, one of the big decision support tools is for the farmer, once the animal is slaughtered, they get feedback of the, the, the carbon and, and economic cost of that. And for the processor, so they can market the animal, you could potentially also put a carbon cost on that particular animal. Okay, thank you. I think there's one more question we've got on the chat line here from um, uh, Frank, and he's really asking the question, whether the, um, the automation that you're seeing on farm is actually uh, increasing the rate of genetic gain, genetic improvement. Do you have evidence for that? Uh, depends on how you define automation. So if we take, for example, milk recording is automated using DIY milk recording that has considerably increased the rate of genetic gain because it improves the accuracy of which we can identify the genetically inferior from um, um, superior animals. Automatic weighing, uh, for beef animals or, or lambs, all has massive potential. Um, now, do you have the you have the, the other other um, things like uh, body automated body condition score? It's not contributing because it's not being widely used. So, if we want these things to to contribute, they must be widely used. But also, more importantly, is the data that has generated from these must be available for use in national genetic evaluations. And there are massive political but also technical hurdles that exist. People don't understand the technicalities that exist in this interoperability between platforms. Getting two platforms to talk to each other, technically very, very difficult thing to do. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Adola. We'll pick some of these things up um, as we go into the general chat, uh, uh, general um, discussion at the end, but thank you very much. That was very, uh, very stimulating. I think we'll now turn to uh, Professor Richard Dewurst uh, will lead us into the next session, uh, next uh, presentation. Um, over to you, Richard. Thanks very much, Wayne. Um, just as my slides come up. I'll, uh... Great. Can you hear me and see my slides okay? Yes, Richard, we can see your slides fine. Yes, yes, uh, yes Richard.
Great. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to speak in this seminar. It's a particular pleasure for me to, uh, to be involved in this meeting as I'm one of the few people that work both for SIUC and for Chugas. And I'm acutely aware of the, the similarities in the missions and approaches and the opportunities for these two organizations to, uh, to work together. Um, particularly excited at the moment as we've just uh, secured uh, a, a new European grant um, that, that SIUC and Chagas have uh, big roles within. So that's really great. The starting point for my presentation is extracting more value for dairy farmers. Uh, my brother is a dairy farmer. My father and grandfathers were all dairy farmers. So however much I've got into academia, I can't get too far away from cows. And the, the traditional approach that SIUC in its research uh, and advisory function has been to focus on improving technical efficiency, uh, putting it back to the farmers as to what they have to do to improve their technical efficiency. Uh, what I want to do in this presentation is to think about opportunities where farmers and processors and retailers can increasingly work together to extract value. Uh, and in the way that Donna has shown how digitalization uh, and data can contribute in the animal breeding area, I want to show how it could support um, some of the developments along the value chain for dairy. So for example, in valorizing the production story, um, speaking into uh, things that concern consumers around, for example, cow welfare and effects on biodiversity uh, and carbon footprints. Uh, but also to think forward to opportunities to use data in optimizing factory processes, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. UK dairy figures, I've given you the, the headline figures here, show some of the background to this. Although the farm gate value of milk in the UK is roughly £3.6 billion per annum, there is a lot more value in the dairy processing um, side of the business and I think opportunities to extract even more. So what do I mean by digitalization? Well, my starting point uh, is so-called precision farming or precision livestock farming. The deployment of sensors, whether that's sensors on animals uh, or in places like robot milkers or uh, at feeding stations. And these sensors will provide real-time information to guide management decisions. At the moment, a lot of it is about helping farmers to manage their animals, the fertility of their animals, the health of their animals. One way to think about uh, this is about um, thinking it as electronic eyes and ears and noses. And in this slide, I've listed some of the examples of electronic eyes and ears and noses. SIUC has a lot of activity in this area, though not all of the, the areas that I've listed here. Just to illustrate the range of sensor tech that is, um, is out there. PLF, Precision Livestock Farming Research, has often built on foundations of basic research for other applications. You, you, you could say that, uh, that, that our sector uh, that hasn't justified development of some of these technologies. So we've often been looking to borrow technologies to apply technologies from other sectors. So thermal imaging that would have been developed for defense, 3D imaging, uh, huge uh, developments in, in computer gaming, ultrasound imaging for medical physics, uh, and, and the, the, the list goes on. So borrowing technology and applying it to questions that we have with our livestock. In other examples, it's been a case of finding new uses for old sensors. So one of, one of the early things that we did with sensing was estrus detection in cattle. It's fairly easy to uh, identify the increased activity of an animal in estrus by placing accelerometers, movement sensors, whether it's in collars or on leg bracelets or ear tags. Fairly easy to detect that increase in activity. But more recent work has been looking at additional information that can be got from the same sensors. For example, looking to predict feeding behavior, feeding times, rumination activity, 
uh, or the amount of time that cows stand, uh, spend lying or standing or, or walking, for example. Specifically around dairy cows, there are lots of sensing opportunities. As I said, animal mounted sensors, sensors in, in milk, um, as, as Donna mentioned, has been used for, uh, for, for a long time offline in, in the traditional herd testing milk recording kind of scenario, but increasingly we're able to measure things uh, in, in milk in real time um, or mounted in milking stations or feeding stations. In the second part of my talk, I want to develop the idea of extending the use of these sensors along the dairy value chain. For example, during milk collection and transport, at milk reception, in the factory and through to retail. And there are two aspects to this. Firstly, the flow of information along with the milk, for example, to help give reassurance to consumers about things like cow welfare, environmental effects, carbon footprint. And secondly, and this is more, I think, uh, more theoretical, less well developed, the opportunity to optimize factory processes to improve product yield and quality by having a better insight into the raw material that's coming into the factory. And this is, this is my point about joining up the value chain. This concept is central to a major funding proposal that's currently under consideration by the UKRI Strength in Places Fund, uh, in which we're partnering with uh, a range of key academic dairy processing and technology companies in our, in our region, Southwest Scotland and Cumbria, one of the biggest dairy fields in the, in the UK. The idea is to start to link up sensing and data along the value chain to deliver things like traceability, control, efficiency, speed, connectivity, transparency, and provenance. Um, and in our project proposal, we envisage demonstration projects along the chain, gradually starting to link things up. For example, looking at farm-based sensing to verify positive cow welfare indicators, connecting up the transport network for, for milk to save costs and also to save carbon. Uh, and, and at the other end, looking at smart milk processing factories using advanced manufacturing principles um, where there's greater connectivity between the farm uh, measurements and performance of that um, raw material when it gets to the factory. Uh, very quickly, when you start thinking about where you can put sensors into that value chain, you have a long list of locations for sensors. Um, In the last few slides, I just want to provide some examples of areas where I, I think that this kind of approach could apply, linking us back to the farm end of things. Traditionally, milk gets analyzed by the processor uh, and often farmers are penalized for problems like the presence of antibiotics in milk or water contamination. Um, but uh, my vision is as we, as we integrate more real-time sensing, there'll be opportunities to correct problems at an early stage, uh, to avoid contamination of other batches where you mix a problem batch of milk with other milk in a tanker, for example, and also to match batches of, batches of milk to optimal factory processes. So having the right milk transported to the right factory for the right, for the right process. And we, we know that there are aspects of the composition of milk that affect the, the yield and quality of, of products. And, and the vision would be to join that up. Here's some more examples of problems affecting dairy processes that could be solved by, by joining up the dairy data chain, uh, the link between what the animals are consuming and uh, processing and quality attributes of milk. And, la and last, uh, my, my last slide here, um, some examples from the, uh, the, the animal health area um, affecting milk composition and processing qualities. Perhaps too many of my examples are about negative components of milk, uh, the kind of things that, that are, are currently penalties in milk pricing schemes. But I do want to finish on a positive note and say that I, I believe that 
uh, digitalization offers potential for many more creative relationships along the dairy value chain. Um, advanced manufacturing or Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, is taking place in many manufacturing sectors, uh, and that's giving progressive incremental gains in efficiency and quality. And it's all about understanding more about all of the raw materials going into the factory. And I see that as a, an, an opportunity for progressive uh, incremental gains uh, in the dairy value chain. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, um, Richard. So please do use the Q and A um, chat line. Um, I think we've got one question that's come in al uh, already. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on how digitalization may help enhance the second point of adding value that you listed, listed? Adding, adding value by the production story, but in terms of biodiversity, carbon footprinting and welfare. So in other words, Richard, what is the opportunities for digital twinning um, potentially around biodiversity and carbon footprinting and welfare? Yeah, so Wayne has, has mentioned uh, di digital twinning. Um, I think for, the, for, for this general audience, and I'm not entirely sure of the composition of the audience, I wasn't wanting to get too deeply into the technologies, but one of the opportunities is to actually uh, develop digital twin models of uh, entire production systems or parts of production systems. Um, I think the, the answer really to the question in terms of things like biodiversity and welfare is currently what the situation that happens on many farms will be that there is manual uh, verification. So uh, people will go on to farm to look at the welfare of cows. Farmers will be scoring cows for various things uh, themselves in, in, in terms of um, the quality assurance types of systems, the, the, the red tractor and, and, and other systems. What I see as the opportunity is to, is to actually develop automated ways of capturing information that will give that in, a, in, a, in an objective way. So re reducing the cost of, uh, of providing some of that information, but, 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 but also providing it in, a, in, an, in an objective way. I mean, some of this is quite futuristic. There are you know, some examples of technologies that are currently being used where, um, where, we, where we can easily see ways that that information could be used along the value chain. Others are, uh, are, are, are more, more theoretical. Okay, thanks, Richard. We got to, I'm, going to, I'm going to pose two questions that have, that have, that have um, come in and uh, before we close down. So if you could be quite um, succinct with the, uh, the answers to these two, Richard, so that we can, we can get through the, um, um, through, the, through the session. The first one is really, what is the level of adoption of precision technologies in dairy farms in Scotland? Is it increasing? And I'll give you the second question as well, so you can you can answer them um, uh, together before we close. And the second part or the second question is around blockchain ledger-based technology and can this be used to can this be used to connect the various components you referred to? Two questions. Yeah, it, the, the the last one I'll I'll leave because I know the next uh, presentations are looking much more at uh, at, at that digital. Um, security and blockchain. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to Hannah. In terms of adoption of precision technologies, yeah, yes, it is increasing uh, ar 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 around the world. I think what we find sometimes is that is that farmers have technology that that the potential of which is is is, is not 100% clear to them. The, the kit they have can do more things than they uh, than, than they realise. So there's a, a job to do about helping them to to um, to get that both for the management purposes and for these other um, applications and down the value chain. What about Scotland? What is the level of uptake in Scotland? Well, there are there are areas like I mean, for some of the common things like estrus detection, there there's quite quite a growth in in in, in use of those technologies. Um, okay. Well, we'll stop there, and I, we can pick some of these things up later as uh, as we progress through the program. I think we're just about uh, on time, Jerry. So um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you both, um, Richard and Donna, for two excellent presentations. And thanks for the questions and keep them going. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Wayne. And uh, we now move on to our second session. And again, I want to remind you um, to please keep your questions coming in. Um, we will get back to some of the questions on the first two presentations for the general and that the general panel discussion. So just please use that Q&A function. Our second uh, speaker from SRUC is uh, Hannah Rudman. And um, Hannah, uh, I guess she's unusual among the panel of speakers this morning in that she has extensive experience in leading digital transformation with multiple numbers of companies. She's a fellow of the British Computer Society and an honorary fellow at Durham University. So Hannah, it's great to have you with us this morning. Thank you uh, very much, Jerry. Can you see my slides okay? And can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yeah, we can. Um, yeah, yes, they're perfect. That's great. Thank you. So I'm Senior Challenge Research Fellow at SRUC. And today I'm going to share insight into how new digital technology is being deployed in the natural economy sector and the benefits it achieves by helping us to do things more easily, better and faster. So Richard's talked about sensors and we're used to the internet helping people connect and interact with each other. But now there are consumer devices on the internet of things, IOT sensors. And these are shaping the way that we live our lives because they give us better insight into the workings of things around us. So a smart home is when physical appliances like central heating, the doorbell, your thermostat, smoke detectors, and so on, are digitally connected with each other and can share data with me, the home dweller, over a mobile application. So what about if we had similarly smart and insightful farms? This is Kirkton and Ochtatire, SRUC's research and demonstration farms near Crean Larrick in the West Highlands. They're home to the SIUC Hill and Mountain Research Centre and the land comprises uh, ploughable land on the floodplain of the River Fillon right up to pastures rising over a thousand metres on the mountain tops and we have installed IOT sensors uh, at these farms. They measure the humidity, the light intensity and other parameters like water levels. So IOT technology really is that umbrella term that refers to connected physical components and digital software. Using the sensor technology, we collect wind direction, speed and temperature measurements from those devices that we've seen on the map at Kirkton for increasing safety for livestock during spells of adverse weather. So here's soil temperature sensors data and the outputs from those sensors over November in 2018. The blue line comes from the sensor at the top of the hill at 520 meters, the green one coming from sensor readings at field level just below the farm. The sensors tell us in real time exactly what conditions are up the hill without us needing to go up there and that removes of course the guesswork of using weather forecasts. So also known as precision agriculture, precision farming is all about efficiency and making accurate data-driven decisions. It's one of the most widespread and effective applications of IoT in agriculture. This North Yorkshire farmer here has fitted the tractor with IoT guidance systems so that they can cultivate and drill more accurately. By using IoT sensors, arable farmers can collect a vast array of metrics on every facet of the field's microclimate and ecosystem, lighting, temperature, soil condition, humidity, carbon levels, pest infections. This data can then be translated into, for example, soil pH maps, which enables farmers to estimate and apply precisely optimal amounts of water, fertilizers and pesticides that their crops need. And of course, that reduces expenses and raises better and healthier crops. Now, 
Over the past few years, there's been a drop in the cost of drones and an increase in the sophistication of the electronics and software used in their design. So drones have small embedded computers that use miniature sensors that detect movement, acceleration, air pressure, and they also uh, have GPS location information and GNSS spatial control, and that's a key requirement to allow their autonomous flight. Drones fly with a smart software system aided by sensors, powered by a battery and motors which rotate the propellers, commonly called blades. So we can learn about the degradation of biodiversity from drones in Costa Rica. There's a project called Deep Forest, which uses drones to monitor tree degradation and the impact of illegal logging. It's hoped that by knowing more about the forest, conservation impacts will be more impactful. So LIDAR sensors on drones can effectively see through the canopy, uh, showing both the full height of the vegetation and the ground below it. Drones are helping uh, also by planting trees. Uh, so startup biocarbon engineering has created a drone that can plant as many as 100,000 trees per day. And they're currently helping with replanting the mangroves around the Irrawaddy River in Myanmar. SRUC's Simon Gibson Poole researches the abilities of drones to identify where there could be a really great agri-food use and the high resolution hyperspectral cameras and the frequent data acquisition that can be obtained by using drones gives several advantages to farmers, including the ability to detect weed species at early stages of crop growth. It can enable crop biomass to be evaluated throughout its growth cycle. And it helps to identify the health of crops during their growth cycle, including nutrient status, water and pest infections. Dr. Gibson Poole, in collaboration with the Science and Advice for Scottish Agriculture Service, has been testing the ability of them with these new capabilities to act as a tool to enable remote inspection of seed potato crops. So SASA trains and assesses plant health officials from the Scottish government over a two week period every year to ensure that their potato inspection skills are up to date. And the officials then go on to perform multiple inspections of seed potato crops. They check for diseases, viruses and rogue potatoes. And we thought, what if they can use drones? And so that's a test that we did. The drones camera captured data that could then be blended with vegetation indexes such as NDVI in the central image on the left here. And when that's combined with the height data, the right hand image is a close up from the area marked on the left in red. It allows for black leg uh, infected potatoes uh, to be identified, the potato plants to be identified. Let's move on to uh, robots. A large UK agri-food consortium has been formed recently to address labour shortages caused by COVID. Um, and they've accelerated the use of robotics for picking and packing soft fruit and veg. At the top in action is a strawberry picker robot designed by Cambridge-based Dogtooth Technologies. The consortium plans to trial several new robot systems this season on farms producing strawberries, apples, blueberries, lettuce and broccoli. And here at the bottom is a NIO technology lettuce picker in action. So already in food growing then, robots are being used for harvesting, seeding, crop inspection and weeding. Robots are also used in animal husbandry. Uh, Richard talked about uh, the Dairy Research and Innovation Centre and the Cow Health Monitoring Project looks at how combinations of IoT sensors and robots work together for early detection of diseases and discomfort in cattle. On the left, you can see the robotic feeders and on the right, the Fullwood Merlin 2 robot milker. Now, this has the ability to recognize the cow. It knows her number from the sensor in her collar. 
and it can tell whether or not she's eligible to be milked at a particular time. And it can allocate the feed specifically to her requirement and in turn measure her milk yield. And of course that data is fed into a decision support tool gathering and analyzing all the data from the robotic milker and the other sensors. So farmers have a user-friendly technology that tells them immediately what a next, next step should be for each animal's health. Detection of problems is four to five days earlier than they would be without the system. The benefits are increased welfare and health and therefore milk production. And it means disorders can be treated earlier in each animal with decreased use of antibiotics on the herd. Now, let's have a look at satellite data and how that's been used in the sector. These pictures come from a Maxar Technologies Earth Observation Satellite orbiting at 600 kilometers above the planet's surface. So at first, the, these images just appear as fuzzy gray blobs and some green splotches. But of course, on closer inspection, the blobs are revealed as elephants wandering through trees. And scientists from the universities of Bath and Oxford are currently using these images to count African elephants from space. A machine learning algorithm is trained to pick out an elephant against the complex backdrop such as the forest. And the breakthrough could allow for up to 5,000 square kilometers of habitat to be surveyed on a single cloud-free day. The solution is far cheaper than current aerial photography survey methods, which need aircraft and people, and it could be used in anti-poaching work. Lyme disease is caught from bites and ticks found in forests and grassland, and diagnosed cases have risen tenfold to an estimated 65,000 a year in Europe. The disease causes substantial losses in productivity with increasing uh, economic and social cost. Our Lime app uh, is satellite data powered and uh, it powers a website and app. So it also integrates with uh, national public health information for the better management of Lyme disease and the prevention of tick bites. SRUC uses a software with Ground Mapper with uh, many of our clients and it's a GIS, Geographic Information Systems tool and ground mapper blends data from satellites with aerial photography from aircraft with field measurements and with other data sets such as ordnance survey maps. GIS allows you to link databases with maps and create dynamic displays like we're seeing here. I'm looking at the north of the Isle of Lewis on the Outer Hebrides and blending Nature Scott's land data type with ordnance survey data. And it's revealing how much of the area is peatland marked by the pink and helps us to sort of understand uh, the health of that peatland by seeing how much water is in the area, the blue areas within the pink. And that uh, with the key uh, gives us extra information. The green hashes on the map correlate with the area being a green asset contributing to Scotland's journey to net zero. So a quick rattle through lots of different technologies there, Internet of Things, sensors, drones, robots and satellite data all being deployed in the natural uh, economy sector. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And that uh, really was a great overview of all the possibilities. Um, in terms of digitalization technologies. Okay, we have a few questions and um, one is really more of a comment uh, and I think an important point that access of course to these digital tools depends on uh, the availability of broadband. And uh, we're, we, we, were, we were already experiencing some difficulties in respect say uh, during COVID with our delivery of educational our educational programs. I'll take that really as a comment. But there's one very interesting question here about the impact of digitalization on the farmer. Um, and I guess I would think the question is really about um, farmers may not always be well equipped to 
embrace the full potential of the technology. If you have any comment on that, given your experience in leading transformational programs in companies, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, digital um, technologies always has to has to work for the end user. So, you know, if you're confident using um, a, a smartphone, then um, you already have the capability to uh, use IoT sensors. They usually are connected to apps and the interface that you as the human needs to use is just the smartphone interface. Um, on the connectivity uh, question, of course, um, many of the uh, tools that we've looked at, like sensors, only need uh, a three or four G connection. Uh, they're sending tiny amounts of data. And at the Hill and Mountain um, Research Center, we have installed something called LoRaWAN, low range uh, wide area networks, uh, which enable um, uh, a kind of local network to effectively be able to transfer those data. Yeah, and uh, just there's a related question here, Hannah, um, concerning the, the is is the take up of this technology likely to lead to uh, or be biased towards larger farms, uh, heavier automation, and if that is the case, then could that have a negative impact on uh, the natural economy? Um, I think in, in, in larger farms, uh, use of things like um, robots makes things um, more, more efficient. So larger farms are always uh, seeking those, effic those efficiencies. Um, in, in small holdings, I think um, it, it actually just makes a, a farmer's life easier um, and, and quicker and better. Um, so we're, you know, we're not taking um, people out of the equation um, apart from in those larger scenarios where um, the, the robots are doing the job, but the jobs might be dangerous. And uh, so, you know, therefore um, it's better to, to have, a, have a machine doing them so that the people can do the things that we're good at, which is making decisions and um, applying our judgment and our insight and our um, intelligence. Yeah, and I guess um, some of the technologies uh, undoubtedly are, uh, would, you'd imagine they would have a neutral impact in terms of scale. I really like the idea of the um, temperature sensors uh, in, in managing animal welfare. It would seem to me to be something which is independent of scale. Right, um, we've got lots of questions coming in. I'm, at this stage, Hannah, I'm going to hold uh, those for the panel session uh, after John's presentation. So um, we'll now move on to a final presentation of this morning, which will be given by my colleague from Chagask, uh, John Highland. And John is a social scientist and um, most of his research, or much of it anyway, has focused on sustainability uh, and on local food systems. And more recently, he has turned his attention to digi digitalization. And um, John is going to talk this morning about um, the EU Fair Share project as he is project manager. This is a large EU wide project, uh, uh, it's a 7 million uh, euro project, in fact. And it's focusing on how uh, advisors and consultants working with farmers can be mobilized to embrace digitalization in their work. John, can you, are you ready yep. to go? I am, yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. See uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Jerry said, uh, my name is John Highland. I'm project manager of the Horizon 2020 project called Fairshare. And uh, today I'm going to present on delivering farm advisory services in the digital age. So before I begin, uh, what exactly is farm extension and farm advisory when we mention it in a digital context? So essentially it's the use of digital technologies to enhance traditional extension approaches, such as written material or physical meetings and as to enable change. So in, in essence, it's the provision of uh, different tools and services electronically. And these tools and services are wide in their scope. 
So they can encapsulate encapsu things such as mobile phone applications, sensors, decision support systems, and more fundamentally, it is the changing of an existing way of doing things into an ICT approach. So to begin, I'll begin with a question, and there are two lines of thought in terms of what this digitalization will mean in terms of advisory services. The first one is, will digitalization uh, be a substitute for farm extension activities and will replace farm advisors in the future? Or alternatively, will digitalization mean that these digital technologies will actually enhance the extension of uh, services provided by advisors? And it's very much the view of John, uh, You're not sharing your screen there, just to let you know that. Okay. Can you see any of my screen at all? Not yet. No. Let's try and just go. Uh, second. I'll go again. It's coming up as being shared on my side. Um, yeah, it's it's coming up now, John. Perfect. Perfect. Well. I thought yep. it was, yeah. Yeah, perfect, okay. So glad you can see that now. So I was just on my second slide. Uh, and basically, as I said, Chagas and Fairshire are, is very much uh, cognizant of that these technologies will be used to actually enhance the activities of advisors in the future. The benefit for farmers is because farming is a knowledge in intensive uh, profession, and increasingly so, these technologies will be used to make quicker decisions and far more responsive de decisions on farm. And for an advisor's point of view, it actually enables advisors to provide tailored and bespoke information to, far to farmers, depending on their context. In terms of global uh, drivers for digitalization, there are many and they come from many different sources. From the farmer side, as I mentioned, farmers want more specific advice and decision support. Digitalization enables that. Advisors want more ways to support and new ways to support their clients. From a governmental point of view, governments want more and easier ways to actually uh, capture administration and capture uh, agri-environmental schemes on farms. So you could see things like geotagging becoming more prevalent in future. And also, as the years roll by, these technologies ultimately become cheaper and cheaper, making them more readily accessible to farmers and advisors. And an interesting thing that I read yesterday as well, it doesn't really fit into the advisory side of things, but there's a push factor as well from consumers and retailers. And it was very interesting to read that SRUC have inter entered into a collaboration with Waitrose to provide information on the, uh, the welfare of animals in terms of products uh, in Waitrose stores. But the most the most prevalent um, driver of digitalization uh, in recent times has been COVID-19. So many advisors and many farmers who didn't participate in digital technologies have done so in the past year because of necessity. Advisors who want to engage with their clients could only do so in many circumstances over the last year or so during lockdowns using technology. So this has opened many advisors' eyes and many farmers' eyes into the usefulness of these technologies. So Chagas itself has 40,000 40, uh, clients uh, and the advisors, the 270 so advisors within Chagas use a suite of different tools, uh, digital tools to engage with clients and to actually provide uh, better and more uh, enhanced uh, advice to their clients. So this schematic uh, provides a representation of just some of the many digital tools available to Chagas advisors and available to Chagas and non-Chagas clients. I don't have enough time to go into too much detail on any of them. I'll briefly mention two. So the first one is called Pasture Base Ireland. It's basically a decision support tool used by farmers to increase grass utilisation on their farm. So on a weekly basis, they'll measure grass growth on each paddock. They'll input this into a software system that will give them a decision support on the demand and supply of grass on their farm and allow them to plan accordingly. This gives nationally a great representation of grass growth in the country and regionally, it offers farmers the opportunity to benchmark themselves against one another in terms of how they're performing in terms of grass utilization. It enables also the Irish Met Office, Met Aaron, on their farming uh, weekly, uh, weekly farming forecast to actually incorporate this data and included in that forecast 
So advisors use this information in discussion groups with farmers, allowing farmers to discuss management practices that increase grass utilization, and it allows farmers to share this information with selected farmers on the system to talk with each other, to engage with each other, and ultimately improve the grass utilization performance nationally and regionally across Ireland. The second uh, tool I'm going to talk about, and uh, Donna mentioned it uh, quite earlier, is in terms of EBI. So the economic breeding index, it's used by dairy farmers to improve, improve the genetic profile of their herd. Uh, this has been really advantageous uh, for, on a national basis, increasing, increasing the genetic performance of the national dairy herd. It also has the implementation, implement, implementation or implementation. It also has the, uh, the impact of actually improving uh, the, the economics performance of, uh, of farmers and enabling them to lower their uh, greenhouse gas emissions per unit of livestock. So in terms of SRUC, uh, I won't claim to be an expert in any of these tools, but it's uh, also encouraging to see that SRUC are invested quite, uh, quite heavily in terms of digitalization, in terms of the tools that they offer their consultants, as well as farmers. So there's the AgriCalc um, tool, which is based on greenhouse gas emissions, capturing management practices, much like the uh, carbon navigator that Chagas uses and which provides a carbon footprint of uh, farms in Scotland. Milknet is like the e-profit monitor of Chagas. It captures the economic performance of, uh, of uh, dairy farms in Scotland, allowing consultants to offer better information to their clients. And finally, Foodbite is another tool used by dairy, beef and sheep farms, uh, where, where uh, rationing uh, formalization is, uh, is uh, measured and actually uh, a decision support tool that uh, clients and uh, clients of uh, consultants can use within SRUC. But nevertheless, there's a quite evident digital divide uh, within agriculture uh, between farmers and uh, advisors and consultants who use digital tools and those who don't use digital tools. And there are many factors for this. In terms of expense, there's a perceived uh, line of thought that these tools are expensive, uh, which isn't always the case. Many of them are freeware. Uh, a lack of awareness of the availability of different tools that are out there, a perception that they're difficult to, to implement, uh, that they're not necessarily relevant to uh, all farming enterprises, a lack of understanding of what they can do on farm, or the advantages that they have, a perception that they're overly complex, and also the connectivity issues in many rural areas. So agriculture by its very nature is, uh, is dominated in, or is, takes place in rural areas. Many of these rural areas don't have fiber broadband, which, which really has an impact in the number of tools that can be adopted. So tools that use you know, offline capabilities, such as Pasture Base Ireland, have a unique advantage in that sense. So we need, we need ways to try and overcome this digital divide and actually target farmers from non-users to users, as well as advisors. And that's where fair share comes in. So as Jerry mentioned, uh, Fairshare is a 7 million euro funded Horizon 2020 project. It's coordinated by Chagas. It has 22 different partners from 15 different countries across Europe. And many of these partners have an advisory service wing, uh, which means we have a direct contact with advisors in these countries across Europe. It's a five year project. It started at the end of 2018 and it's due to finish at the end of 2023. And ultimately it aims to uh, incre increase the adoption and implementation of these tools across advisory services in Europe, which ultimately will mean that farmers will increase their ability to digitalize as well. There are two pillars on which the project stands on. Firstly, it wants to increase awareness of the number of tools that are out there. It's doing this firstly by building an inventory of advisory tools available to advisors. And secondly, it wants to create user cases of implementation of digital tools. And it's doing this by the implementation of user cases, which I'll talk about later. So in the project, uh, it's all about digital advisory tools and services. So we're explicitly focusing on the advisor. We call these DATs in the project. They're broken down into three different categories. First category is communication tools. These tools are like your videos, your mobile phone applications, such as WhatsApp, also text messaging and email. Then you have e-services applications. These are like the decision support tools that were mentioned earlier on. Also things like sensors, e-mapping, e-training. And then if we look at it from an organizational point of view, so an organization 
uh, Chagas or SRUC have a different suite of tools that they need to do to manage their clients and to manage their relationships. So we have client billing relationship management tools and we also have client, uh, client relationship tools. So these are tools at an organizational level. So to give you a small, give you a brief rundown of the inventory, the, the fair share inventory was first established at the beginning of last year. Uh, at this moment in time, it has 214 different tools that can be used by advisors from across Europe. So if you're a consultant uh, in SRUC and you have a particular challenge uh, and you're acutely aware that that tool, that there isn't a tool available in the UK to address that challenge, then you could use this inventory to search tools to see maybe in a European context, is there a tool that could be, that is developed and already developed that could actually address that challenge? And maybe there could be potential to actually adopt that tool to meet the challenges that you have. So as I said, there's 214 tools on the inventory at the moment. About 17% of those fall into communication tools, 80% into the analytical tools that I spoke, talked about, so the e-services tools, and 3% at the organizational level. So if you are an advisor and you actually want to uh, document your tools on the inventory, please do. It doesn't take that long. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes. If, in terms of one of the most uh, interesting facets of the project so far, you know, on top of the inventory was uh, questionnaires that were administered last year, last summer, to advisors and to farmers throughout Europe. So two different sets of questionnaires. So in total, we did nearly 700 advisors who took part in the surveys and about 300 farmers. And uh, briefly, the results highlight the type of tools that are being, uh, that are being used by farmers and advisors. So if we look at from an advisory point of view, most advisors uh, throughout the continent are using email, phone, and text messages uh, quite prominently. So that's not a surprise. They also use social media. Considering the year that was in it, webinars and farminars are quite prominent. When we look at benchmarking tools and analytical tools, they're further down the list. Uh, so, you know, they're not as, uh, they haven't been implemented to such a wide extent as the other tools uh, that I have uh, outlined. So the main findings from the survey is that the positive influence of advisors, farmers have highlighted that they're far more likely to adopt a tool if that has been promoted by their advisor, even more so than their peers. So their, their, uh, their farmers or their farming or peers themselves. Uh, we're a long way off from all clients, advisory clients and using, uh, using digital tools. Uh, currently 26% uh, use less than uh, use uh, or 26% 20, of clients of advisors uh, use tools at all, uh, which is quite worrying. There's a lack of availability and interoperability between tools, which is a major challenge. Advisors really rely on their organization in terms of the tools that they use. So we hope that the fair share inventory will actually broaden the perception of advisors and increase awareness of the tools that are out there and could be available to them. There's a need to build up digital digital uh, competence on both the farmer side and the advisor side. This has been highlighted by both, that they feel like they don't have necessarily the skills to uh, adopt all the tools that they would like. And uh, advisors recognize the need for training, particularly one-to-one uh, -one training or face-to-face -face training rather than uh, online training. And lastly, I'm gonna finish off mentioning the fair share user cases. So one of the most, uh, I suppose unique aspects of the project is the user cases that Fairshare has uh, and Fairshare will fund. Uh, 20 of these user cases will be dedicated to uh, the project partners, so the interim project partners. They'll be funded to the tune of 90,000 euro. And essentially a user case is a challenge perceived by a group of advisors and implementing a technology or a digital tool or service to overcome that challenge and observing what are the uh, you know, strategic approaches that they take and the challenges that they have. So if you're an external entity not involved in the project, that doesn't mean that you cannot possibly or potentially take part in these user cases. From March onwards, the procurement process will begin in identifying 20 external user cases to be involved in the project. So if you're an SRUC consultant and want to get involved, you're more than welcome to. 10 of these external user cases will be funded by 90,000 euro. Another 10 will be funded by 30,000 euro. So we'll provide financial support, but on top of that financial support, we'll also provide uh, strategic support in terms of how you can adopt the tools that you think that you need. The tendering begins in March of 2020, 
So keep an eye on the, the social media uh, uh, profiles of the project uh, and the project website itself to gain more information. So I'll finish on that. If you've any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If you've any questions on the project, you can uh, contact me by my email address, or you can also follow the project and its progress using the, the following links and social media uh, accounts. So thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks, John. And um, I think uh, the Fair Share project seems uh, really, really interesting and important. Uh, I just remind um, our viewers the, to keep on sending in your questions. We'll uh, we'll be moving to the panel session shortly, and um, we'll be able to pick up some of the questions that we couldn't address um, uh, earlier. John, just um, a question was asked earlier about the number of farmers that are adopting um, digital technologies. Could I ask the same question in relation to advisors? What's your sense percentage-wise? And I'm, I'm not talking now about uh, mobile phones and so forth, but um, you know, the uh, more sophisticated decision support tools. Yeah, so... Yeah, in terms of, as you said, the mobile phones and that, like most advisors are using that already or things like Zoom or uh, and applications like that. In terms of decision support tools, uh, not to the same extent, not to the same extent. And in, in actual fact, most of the digital, digital tools that advisors are using is dependent on manual input. So there's a real lack of uh, tools using actually things like the Internet of Things sensors uh, and capturing data in that extent. So that's where most of, I think the process needs to concentrate on implementing these technologies on farms to actually have better, and uh, to actually have better data coming into the, the tools themselves to be able to provide better uh, and tailored advice to farmers. And uh, there's a, an important question here relating to the COVID circumstances Mm -hmm. which clearly has um, accelerated the use of digital tools among advisors and among farmers. Um, how can we build on, on the momentum that has been generated, John, in your view, to, uh, to encourage uh, more widespread adoption of, of the technologies that you're talking about? Yeah, I think uh, COVID uh, has been, I wouldn't say an advantage, but it's been definitely, definitely has highlighted the usefulness of digital technologies to, to farmers and advisors. And I think really to keep that momentum, we, we, need, to, we need to train, uh, professionally train advisors uh, in terms of digital tools. I, I think train the trainer events is brilliant. So peer-to-peer -peer learning, if we can actually encourage you know, advisors who are experts in particular tools uh, to train their peers, uh, that, that can be extremely beneficial. Actually, building multi-actor multi networks of farmers, advisors, and researchers in terms of you know, building tools and developing tools has huge advantages as well and actually increases the adoption of those tools as well. Okay, John, thank you. And um, I'll, I'm going to ask all of our speakers now to be alert for questions as we head into the discussion. And um, uh, that will be jointly chaired by Wayne and myself. And I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Wayne uh, to commence that discussion. Wayne, over to you. Thanks, Jerry, And thanks, um, John and Hannah, for your presentations. I, I think I, I, I'll maybe um, start the conversation off and then, uh, Jerry, come back to you to take, pick up a couple of other questions. I, I want to pursue one of the themes that is coming out latterly in this session is the is the role of COVID, and the role of COVID in terms of changing um, perhaps expectations, mindsets, and behaviour, and particularly an increased uh, focus on localism, and an increased focus on provenance. And uh, maybe I could turn to you, Hannah, to start maybe. Um, uh, highlighting some of the opportunities that might arise from digital technologies in relation to um, localism and how that uh, may be an opportunity for, for agriculture farming and the green economy going forward. Yeah, thanks Wayne. We're, um, we're seeing um, uh, local, local groups uh, kind of beginning 
uh, to form uh, kind of bioregions together. Um, and the benefit of uh, that is that as, um, as things uh, change and uh, everybody uh, is beginning to think about a, a greener rural um, economy, groups of farmers being able to work together, to pool data together about the uh, good activities that they're doing, the carbon sequestering activities, the biodiversity enhancing activities that they're doing, and proving that they're doing it through uh, collecting uh, data either from sensors or, or from cameras um, is uh, definitely one way that uh, I see that happening. Thanks, Anna. And of course, there's the whole area of blockchain and ledger-based technology to really kind of add premium to, to, to products as well, which I think is, uh, is becoming a, a, an, important, uh, an important area. Do you want to quickly comment on that before I maybe pause? Yeah, we haven't um, talked um, much about distributed ledger technology or, or blockchain today. I think um, it, it's emerging at the moment. Um, it's definitely important when... Uh, uh, transparency is an issue um, and uh, trust uh, in data is an issue. Um, so, uh, you know, we're beginning um, to pilot uh, this technology um, to enable truths about what has been done to uh, perhaps food or animals um, to, to come to the fore. Um, but uh, yes, I think someone asked whether it would connect all the technology. It, it won't, APIs will connect all the technology, but what it will do is bring trust to the data. Okay, well, well maybe just to, um, to um, pass the button on to Jerry with, with a, a theme that's been coming through, or one of the, one of the questions that, are, that, 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 that I'm sensing coming through, Jerry, is, well, um, we've heard about the technology, we're hearing about the, the opportunities, but um, what are the downsides um, and what are we doing to mitigate any downsides emerging from the application of um, digital technology, the full spectrum of technologies? So maybe that's a question for all our panelists. And I'll then stop, uh, Jerry, and you can take on the next series of questions. I'm not, Richard, if you want to kick off with that. Yeah, it was kind of kind of related, but going back to this question about localism, and um, one of the questions that I, apparently I, I answered in the Q and A, and it's disappeared off the Q and A, was this question about quality of internet access, uh, and and I think the point about um, local issues that that there are some really interesting developments in terms of um, local private uh, networks that that are now feasible. I mean, I'm not techie to the point of knowing much detail about that but I know for example the University of Strathclyde are, are running a project called 5G New Thinking um, I, some of the things around connecting up uh, the dairy value chain I, I could see really fitting very well with with local networks and, and that's a kind of win-win because you know you, you you need to you need the internet to join up the or the local private network to join up the um, the players in that, but you're also providing a service for remote, remote rural regions that are struggling with their internet. So the farmers and the and the people in their village and the, and 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 the, and the kids doing their homeschooling or whatever are are, are all going to be getting internet access as as part of that vision. Over to you, Jerry. Okay, thanks, Wayne. And um, as always in these events. Uh, time seems to catch up with us. But um, another theme I think that was uh, sparked by um, the present Hannah's and John's presentation is the potential for digitalization to, to transform how we deliver our agriculture consulting services. And, and a related point um, which is looking ahead to the newer, very exciting digital tools such as AR and AI and whether they will have the potential or any potential to be used by our consultants in the field. So is that something, um, Hannah, that you'd like to respond to? And then I'll ask John to come in, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, we're, we're seeing 
augmented reality AR um, being uh, used for um, uh, uh, help helping people on site. Um, so uh, AR is when uh, on your screen, you have an image um, projected onto what your camera is looking at. So um, imagine if you were a, a trainee vet in field, you could be directed uh, what to do um, by someone uh, back in the, the lab somewhere else. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're just beginning to see um, early early um, studies on that. It's used more in the um, uh, renewable energy uh, sector. So there's there's plenty of uh, kind of case studies there where um, people have to uh, go out and, and fix things that are in, in really remote places. Um, and they need to, you know, show uh, the person back at the office what they are looking at. So um, that's going to be an important uh, development, I think. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm sure Stan Lawler, head of our newly appointed head of uh, our knowledge transfer services, would be interested in that uh, opportunity. Um, John, can I just ask you maybe to visualize, uh, based on your, your fair share work and other work, what our advisory services might look like, look like in the next five years, say, with digitalization? What will be the big observable change? Yeah, well, I, I think on a whole, uh, advisory services will be more data driven than they are right now, which I think can be only a good thing in terms of the the ability of advisors to provide, you know, unique uh, advice to their clients. I think as well, it offers advisors potentially more time to spend on farm with farmers, less time in the office, depending on the hardware that they have. It'll also, I think from an advisory experience, perspective free up time that they would traditionally use collecting basic information, basic farmer information uh, and farm information and, and allow them to actually concentrate more on talking to farmers about their options and what op management options in terms of practices that they could implement on farm. And that could create the possibility as well to engage with more clients. So I think there's, there's a lot of potential positives in terms of digitalization and the relationship between farmers and advisors uh, that could potentially happen because of this data-driven uh, prerogative. Jerry, can I come in and, hey, and um, comment from? Sorry, Wayne. Yes, from an SAUC perspective, from a consulting perspective, I think that um, this is a really good question, and it's a, clearly we're running out of time, so I'm going to be succinct. I think one of them is going to be around monitoring and metrics, and with the drives for public money for public goods, I think there's going to be a need for us to be able to have the metrics to be able to support payments uh, in whatever form that may take. So I think sensory technology, being able to measure um, whether it's soil health, whether it's to measure whatever metrics are, are in use, I think digitization and sensory technology is going to be critical. I think the other big driver is going to be actually um, from green finance. And with the climate emergency and with the, uh, you know, the, the, the developments in terms of uh, expectations of meeting targets, the whole finance area and how that is going to pivot to support future farming and food production in a new, with a new narrative, I think there's going to be a real interesting um, area there. And thirdly, I think perhaps how um, advisors are going to be key components of a new research agenda where there's going to be co-design opportunities for um, looking at new ways of really um, driving the research processes which are going to be much much more embedded with data so those are the sort of themes we're thinking about in SIUC and we'd love to pursue that Jerry with you uh, um, and our two institutions going forward I think there's some very interesting common themes there. Oh, I absolutely agree and um... Wayne, just you mentioned green finance. Uh, we had some interesting discussions recently with some colleagues in CIRAD uh, in their work in um, Africa in particular on this very issue. And um, can I just, I know we're very short of time, but there was a question from earlier that I think was a very important one for Donna. Uh, and it relates, Donna, to the uh, role of non-economic traits in breathing indices and decision-making and, and um, whether you see um, that happening, uh, particularly around the, uh, in tackling the grand challenges. Though as an economist, I find it very difficult 
to, to visualize something that could be non-economic, but that's one question. And a related point, Donna, which certainly has been a concern of mine as I observe the multiplicity of information that's now available through sensors, etc., driven by the private sector, and inv invariably their, their single um, variable sensors. Uh, I mean, can we develop tools or is that where we can bring all this information together on the premise, of course, that more information is always better? Yeah, so, yeah, thanks, Jerry. So I answered the first question in, in the chats. Um, there is nothing whatsoever to stop us from generating estimates of genetic merit for individuals as a standalone trait. The only thing that stops that is the availability of useful data. Now, whether you bring that into an overall breeding goal, then that becomes a philosophical discussion about is it sufficiently important for everybody? And if it is important, well, what is the relative importance of, I think it was, um, ability to withstand or ability to, to go two days without drinking? How important is that relative to actually producing milk or relative to producing a calf? And that's a, that's a discussion that has to be done. But there are techniques using what we call selection index theory, whereby you can back calculate the weight that you should put on a trait to achieve what we call a desired gains. Um, so, the, so the opportunity is, is certainly there. And this is the beauty, as I said earlier, about breeding goals is that they are modular. So if, if, you don't, if you're a dairy farmer and you're not interested in the beef, you can just pluck the beef component of the EBI out and resort your, your animals based on that without beef. Or you could double the emphasis. Um, the second question, Jerry, what was it again? Well, uh, Donna, it was a, it was a long winded yeah. question, but I was basically saying, there's an awful lot of information now coming through sensors, but they're all individual sensors, if you like. Yeah. And they're all developed by individual companies. Yeah. Is, is the day far off when we'll be able to harness that information collectively in some way? So again, everybody, when they talk about precision agriculture, when I talk about precision agriculture, it's milk recording and weighing animals and all that data is all inside in the database. That's precision. Um, okay, you have additional information like uh, accelerometers, body condition score measurements, and the only way that you're going to get those uh, to, to, to be useful or available for use in like the genetic evaluations or supplementary decision support tools is a two-way interaction of the data. So you could have a, a system that measures accelerometry as a predictor of the cow and estrus with a sensitivity of, let's pretend, uh, 95%. Now, if you also had the milk yield of that animal and realize that it's dropping in milk yield, supplemented by increasing in movement, that is indicative, more indicative or stronger indication that the cow is coming on estrus. So it's a benefit to the accelerometer company that they have a piece of supplementary information that builds the confidence on their prediction. And then that data has to go into the repository to be used and for genetic evaluations for people like me to realize where the, the estrus is. I just, just before I do finish, the one worry I do have about all this thing is for genetic evaluations, whereby uh, farmers may impose some sort of a treatment. So for example, you may have some technology that predicts the onset of mastitis. Well, if you didn't know that, the cow would get mastitis, I would get the data, we do a genetic evaluation. Now, if you have a prediction of that, the farmer may go in with anti-inflammatories, vitamin E or, or some sort of uh, uh, prophylactic treatment. The cow does not get mastitis, so now we are breeding for cows who are responding to treatment. And that's a big worry that I have. Okay. Thank you. And um, I'll ask you in a second, uh, hand over to you, Wayne, to say our goodbyes and thank yous. But um, on my behalf, uh, I do want to thank Mike Smith and SRUC and of course my own colleague, Lance O'Brien, for um, organizing this event. I want to thank Wayne, of course, and particularly all of our speakers, Hannah Rudman, uh, Richard Dewhurst, um, uh, Donna Berry, and John Highland, and indeed Mark Gibson, who is, um, has anchored the whole event today. So look, uh, thank you for, uh, for tuning in. And um, I'm really delighted we were able to have this session, Wayne, and uh, uh, we, we will, of course, continue our collaboration on these and other areas into the future. Wayne. Well, thanks, Jerry, And uh, let me just echo the thanks to all our colleagues and to, um, 
to Mike and Lance in particular for putting this together. Um, but look, we've got a fantastic relationship um, between our two institutions and this is all about people and it's all about people collaborating and working together. And I think we're, um, it's really important we continue this because we've also got some pretty big challenges facing us, but also some opportunities and we need to be collaborating to capture those opportunities. But I'll pause there at uh, a great couple of hours. Thank you very much for um, your participation and engagement, your questions, and uh, we'll continue. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to all our panelists, and thank you to all the viewers for excellent questions. And to remind everybody that uh, this session has been recorded and will be available on the Chagask and SRUC websites, along with the presentations. So, with that, we uh, wish you a good day, and uh, we look forward to continuing this collaboration over the next number of years. So, thank you, everybody. <laughs>